Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. As India prepares to celebrate 75 years of independence, a book published later this month raises critical issues that are central to the question I want to raise. What sort of country is India at 75? Here is the book and it's called Challenges to a Liberal Polity and its author is the former Vice President of India, Hamid Ansari. Today Mr. Ansari joins me to talk both about the book as well as about India at 75. Mr. Ansari, in just over a week's time, India will celebrate 75 years of independence. As you look back, have we as a country stayed true and faithful to our constitution, or have we at times turned our back on it, and even on occasion betrayed it? Well, to begin with, our crowning achievement was that we managed to draft and implement a constitution within a matter of uh, months, literally. That has not happened to great many uh, countries that gained independence from imperial rule. So the positive side is that that was our achievement and by and large we have stuck to it. But that does not mean that we have not deviated from it consciously or otherwise. How egregious were the deviations? Well, the deviations are, some of them are very well known. Everybody talks about 75, everybody talks about 2002, 1984. But the first serious deviation took place within 18 months or so of the promulgation of the constitution. You're talking about the First Amendment? First Amendment. And it was passed, in fact, by an interim parliament one that under the constitution was not authorized to amend the constitution. So that makes the deviation even worse. You see, it's an old debate which got reflected in it. The right to property and what are the constraints on it? What are the benefits? What are the constraints? And that debate, in a sense, continues to this day. But the point you're making is that within 18 months of the constitution being promulgated, we were already questioning and reviewing and revising some of the commitments and principles it contained. Because that is in the nature of our society. The debate that took place in the Constituent Assembly, and that's a remarkable document, the compendium of debates. All views were reflected there. And some of the views were not um, jettisoned completely. Which is why we had amendments. And so which many is why them. we had amendments and which is why we continue to have amendments. We've got pretty close to 100 amendments. In comparison, America hasn't even, I believe, touched 25. Exactly. And yet their constitution is almost two and a half centuries old. In 2017, in your address to the National Law School in Bangalore, you said, and I'm quoting you, there is evidence to suggest that we are a polity at war with itself in which the process of emotional integration has faltered and is in dire need of reinvigoration. Why did you want to describe India as a polity at war with itself? Well, firstly, what is a polity? Uh, any group of people who agree to abide by certain norms of existence, that is polity. I but mean, why at war with itself? Because the values 
which go to condition that uh, polity uh, remain in dispute. In other words, the fundamental values that we gave ourselves in our constitution remain in dispute. Well, the implementation of those values, I mean, go back to the first, first page of the constitution, the preamble. The basic principles are all there, you know, equality, etc., etc. Et the most important thing there, everybody agrees with equality, uh, rights, all that. The last bit. Fraternity. Fraternity, on which uh, Dr. Ambedkar put so much of emphasis. But you know, you're making a very interesting point. You're saying it's the implementation of the values that is the problem. But if values are not implemented, they're not adhered to. So what you're saying actually is that's the adherence to the values that is the problem. We have the values, we acknowledge them, we just don't adhere to them depends on the extent to which we adhere. We can adhere 5% or 95%. And you are suggesting we often adhere not fully, sometimes as poorly as 5%. Yes, we do. We do. As poorly as 5%. The constitutional history of modern India will show where adherence has deviated from the principles. Can you give me an example where adherence has been as low as 5 and 10 percent? Oh, any number of examples can be given. That's a long debate. We can go into that. In other words, there are many constitutional values where our adherence is a pathetic 5 to 10 percent. Could be. Could be. It will require a mathematical calculation to see. But that raises serious concerns about India's acceptance and implementation of the constitution. If there are many areas where adherence is just 5 percent, then we are actually honouring it more in name than in practice. You see, I give you one simple example. You have a principle there, fraternity. And what was meant by fraternity has been dilated at great extent by Dr. Ambedkar. But fraternity means in simplest language, I am your brother, you are my brother. Do you accept what goes with these two simple sentences or you do not? Today, the great debate in Indian society is about fraternity. Indian citizens do not always accept each other as brothers. Precisely. And I imagine… Or brothers and sisters. I imagine that's even more so when there is a religious divide between them. Not just a religious divide, there are all kinds of divides. Caste as well. You see, the nature of our society is such that there is diversity. It's an existential reality which cannot be wished away. You start from Ladakh and go down to Kanyakumari. Diversity comes in the way of fraternity. Absolutely. Over the years, one of the things you say in your book that has changed fairly considerably is the way we view nationalism and Indianness. I am going to quote from you. You say, for many decades after independence, a pluralistic view of nationalism and Indianness characterized our thinking. Now what you call purifying exclusivism has taken over the political cultural landscape. Can you explain that a little further? Well, if you begin with the basic principle that this is a very diverse society, that pluralism is not an option, it is an existing reality which has to be accepted. Now, if you deviate from that principle, then you are in troubled waters. What do you mean by purifying exclusivism? Oh, any number of examples can be found in the current debates in our society. Are you talking about the view that this is a mainly Hindu country, Hindutva as it is popularly called? I do not understand precisely what the meaning of that term is, but the point is that this is a country characterized by diversity of every kind. I said a little earlier that you start from Ladakh and go down to Kanyakumari. What is uni common point in this journey? In other words, the attempt to make a uniformity out of the Indian people is what purifying is. It's a non-starter. It's a non-starter. Absolutely. Do you then agree with the view that is increasingly expressed that the great difference between India in 2022 and India in 1947 
is that in 2022, India is becoming increasingly majoritarian, inward-looking, perhaps even intolerant, and a country that's convinced that we have more to teach the world than to learn from the world. Well, look at it this way. When you are talking of the world of 1947, it was a different world. We knew our differences, but we didn't care too much about it because we didn't, it didn't impact us on a daily basis. Today, in the technology available to us today, what happens in Kanyakumari or what happens in Ladakh is known to everybody. Well, are you suggesting that in 47 we knew our differences, but they didn't matter? Of course. Now those differences have become points of great division. Because they are a living reality now. Living reality in a very real sense. Of all the constitutional values that over the last 75 years have weakened, how important is secularism to the future of India? Or can Hindutva easily replace it without affecting the integrity of the country? You see, go back, why... I mean, we started with the principle that we are a polity governed by rule of law. What does rule of law mean? I think Professor Bakshi has written somewhere about it, that it has four essential ingredients. It means rights, it means governance, it means development, and uh, it means uh, equality. So, if you cannot dispense that in fair measure, I am not saying equal measure, fair measure to every citizen of this country, because that raises in itself what is a citizen, who Absolutely. is a citizen. Absolutely. But the rule of law is separate to secularism. Come back to my question. Of all the constitutional values, that have weakened over the last 75 years, how important is secularism to the future of our country? What is our understanding of secularism? It is not the French understanding. We, it is, does not mean irreligion. Treating because, all religions as equal it, and not discriminating and, against any. And state keeping itself at a certain distance, calibrated distance. So how important is secularism to the future of India? You look at the diversity of India in just in terms of religious values or social values. What is common? I mean, take a simple thing. But to answer my question, how important is secularism it's to that diversity? It's critical. It's absolutely critical because the... Let's take one example. There's so much talk these days about uh, common civil code. I have a learned friend, learned in, the, in laws, who said a long time back, Produce a draft and then I'll talk. Has anybody produced a draft of this day? No. Let's Why? come back to secularism. If secularism is critical, and that was your word, yes. to the future of India, can Hindutva replace it without affecting the integrity of the country? If what is meant by Hindutva is homogenization, then it cannot. So, the more secularism as a foundational principle of our constitution is weakened, the weaker become the sinews that bind our country together. Oh, bound to be. Bound to be. You see, if you question my right as a citizen to be equal beneficiary of a right, simply because either the kind of food I eat, the region I come from, or the god I profess to uh, worship, then it's a different matter. Then it's not a question that I am a Bengali, you are a Gujarati or anything else. So you are really worried by the fact that over the last eight years in particular, our adherence to secularism has weakened considerably. Not just over the last eight years, it has always been somewhat ambivalent. From 47 onwards? Yes. Well, 47 it was not so clear, but in uh, last few decades, it's been very clear. And has it got even worse over the last eight years? I would say so, yes. And this is endangering? Because means of communication are much quicker and therefore we get to know what happens within a matter of minutes. And this is endangering India? Oh, no question about it. If you basic values of the constitution and the inherent values within the basic values are questioned, then it is 
a weakening in and India. secularism is one of those core oh, values. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It is rare there in the text of the constitution. Let's come to another aspect of India today. In the introduction to this book, you point out how increasingly the state uses the Unlawful Activities Act to silence dissent, to target opponents, sometimes even to imprison critics. And I suppose you could add the use of the law of sedition and increasingly the use of the Money Laundering Act, particularly against political opponents. Does this suggest that for our rulers, power is everything and values and principles don't matter as much. Look, to say that it is only tr true of one set of rulers would be a, a mistake. All rulers. All rulers have throughout history. But what about in India? Stick to India. In India, of course. Rulers have deviated whenever they can get away with it. That is why you need a vigilant public opinion. So, in India, over the last 75 years, our rulers no matter which party they have come from, have actually valued power more than principles and ideals. That is in the nature of power. Let us be very pragmatic about it. Power can be exercised only when you have controls over the instrumentalities of power. But we have been happy or our rulers have been happy to use powers like the Unlawful Activities Act or the Sedition Law or now more recently the Money Laundering Act, to target opponents to silence dissent. Is that a yes? Yes, sir. And this is a misuse of power that has become part of the Indian political tra 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 tradition. Any, any use of power which is a deviation from the basic principles of the constitution is a misuse of power. But this is well established in India. So we, it is a fact of life. You know it, I know it. This is another aspect of 75 years, the misuse of power by our rulers for their advantage at our cost. As we experience it today, each day you and I come across examples of deviation from it. Now, for 10 years as chairman of the Rajya Sabha, you were also literally at the ringside of parliament and you had a wonderful view of the functioning of parliament. That is another aspect of our 75 years that I want to talk to you about. As you saw parliament for 10 years as chairman of the Rajya Sabha, how effectively was it fulfilling its two key duties? A, to scrutinize legislation and secondly, to hold the government, whoever the government was, to account. This process has been going on for a longish period. Uh, deviation from the actual functions of an institution. After all, governance means a totality of institution, whether they are uh, judicial institutions or executive institutions or legislative. But talk about parliament for now. Parliament, legislative, fun what are the functions of parliament? To make laws, to debate them before you make laws, to scrutinize the functioning of the executive, shed light on the burning issues of the day which may be taken up by this member or that member. How effectively has parliament been doing this? Look, look at it in purely statistical terms. How many days does parliament sit in a year? There was a time when the Indian parliament would record around 100 days. Your book says it is now down to 50 or 40 even. I am not uh, inventing it. Uh, it can be easily checked. So, Parliament's diligence over the last 75 years has gone down fairly markedly. It has. It has very much so. And that means what? It means in practice that the scrutiny of A, the actions of the executive, B, of proposed legislation and 3, it's debate on the issues that arise on day-to-day -day basis. All three has gone down. There is no time. In fact, one of the statistics that emerges from a book is particularly worrying. It seems that in the 15th Lok Sabha, as many as 26 percent of all bills were passed within 30 minutes of being introduced on the floor of the house. In the 16th Lok Sabha, 
as little as 25% of bills are actually sent to parliamentary committees for scrutinization. If you take those two sets of statistics together, doesn't that prove your point? Parliament is simply not scrutinizing legislation anywhere near effectively. It is evident and the public knows it very well. So Parliament is letting us down. It is, it is at the cost of the citizen. And at the cost of our democracy too. Absolutely, bound to be. In other words, the functioning of Parliament over the last 75 years not only has deteriorated, but it hasn't really lived up to what we hoped for when it was created in the constitution. The statistics bear me out. It is just simply not doing its job. Those are harsh words, but true words. Parliament is simply not doing its job. Look, being chairman, I was privy to the actual participation. And you've seen this failure every day for 10 years with your own eyes. Take uh, committees, for example. Now, the rule requires that members will attend meetings of committees, whatever the committee might be. Very often, what happens is that about one third of the members actually participate. They all sign the book in the beginning or at the beginning of the day. So they are not serious about it. That is why parliamentary committees, which once upon a time used to do very good work, and even today some of them are doing good work. But the, in the main they are not. In the main they are not. But you are saying something else. You are also saying the commitment, the diligence of MPs has gone down. Political parties govern MPs. To say that individual MPs are independent is a misnomer. If the parties don't want them to participate effectively, they don't participate. So the blame often lies not with individual MPs, but with the parties that govern them. Principally with the parties, with the understanding of their functioning by the parties themselves. As someone who's been chairman of the Rajya Sabha for 10 years, who had this ringside view of the functioning of parliament, what do you believe are the steps that are necessary to revitalize and reinvigorate parliament? It's not very difficult. A lot of work has been done on it within the country and internationally. What are the three steps you would identify? I would like parliament to go back to at least 100 days a year. Number two? Number two, that the committee work should be reinvigorated. With more bills being sent than just 25%? Yes. Now, I give you a simple example. The British Parliament has a practice, uh, not of ancient uh, vintage, but of recent origin. There is a day known as, in the House of Commons, uh, Prime Minister's Day. The Prime Minister has to appear in person and answer questions in person. Do we need to adopt that convention? It would, it would be a very healthy dose. But I'm afraid you're not likely to succeed. But it's something you'd like to see? Very much so. Because he is the leader of the governing party. And therefore, he's accountable. Something else that happens in the British Parliament is that something like 20% of the time is set aside for the opposition to raise issues and the government cannot demur or disagree. That allows the opposition, at least for that 20%, to set the agenda. Should this also be a convention we adopt? Why not? Why not? I, I mean, everybody is equally concerned. If I have a matter of concern, I should be allowed to raise it. Of course, there has to be a framework of rules and procedures. But that's not very difficult to implement. How confident are you that these very democratic procedures which would reinvigorate our parliament will be adopted? I'm afraid I can't uh, talk about what will happen in the future. I only can share with you my own experience. But you're not very confident this will be adopted? No. No? No. Let's talk a little about India's Muslims. They represent pretty close to 15% of the population, but there is a view that after the 2011 census by 2022, the total number could be close to 200 million. Well, that is the working figure, generally speaking. Absolutely. And yet, Akar Patel's book, Our Hindu Rashtra, says 
that India's Muslims only constitute 4.9% of state and central government employees, 4.6% of the paramilitary services, 3.2% of the IAS, IFS and IPS and perhaps just 1% of the army. Why is Muslim representation in these public services so abysmally low? The responsibility would lie on both sides. Uh, government services at certain levels upwards require a commitment to compete and win. Not at the lowest level. If you are recruiting only a driver huh, or a class 4 employee, then you don't have to pass a competitive examination. So the one fault of one side of the fault would lie with the participants themselves. I've seen it in practice. You mean Indian Muslims don't push themselves to get those jobs? Did not in the past, not now. But if they are now pushing themselves to get the job and their levels are almost uniformly from what I've just cited, below 5%. These figures are older. But the book came out two years ago. Yes, I know. No, the book didn't come out two years ago. <laughs> it came out quite recently. No, no, no. Akar Patel's book. Ka uh, yeah. Where I've got these figures from came out two years ago. No, no. The Is the system militating against Muslims getting these jobs? It has been rumoured. It has been opined. But statistically... I don't know whether it can be proved QED. In other words, we can't prove the system militates against Muslims getting jobs, but many people believe that is the reason. That is a very widespread belief and there is truth in it. So you share the belief? I share the belief to some extent. Not, en not entirely. For example, I give you an example because it's not in the public domain. When Sajar committee was doing its work, you know, Justice Sajar's committee, it had a team of very competent professionals artistic it and they had drafted questionnaires now those questionnaires have never been made public i am privy to some of them uh, the questionnaire was sent for example to the three wings of the armed forces two of them replied one of them refused to reply says it's bad for morale now it can be a valid excuse or may not be a valid excuse. But the point is, data can always be manipulated. And the point you're making is that in many cases, prejudice comes in the way of Muslims getting jobs. Some kind of prejudice does come in. But it's not just in terms of public service that Muslim representation is abysmally low. It's even shrinking in terms of representation in politics. In your book, you point out that of the 790 people together, MPs, in India's two houses of parliament, in 1980, 49 were Muslim. By 2014, it had collapsed to 23. Correct. Today, India doesn't have a single Muslim chief minister. In 15 states, there isn't a Muslim minister. In 10, there is just one. How do you explain that to yourself? It uh, explains itself that there is a disinclination, I shall not use a stronger term for it, to have Muslim candidates as people seeking elections. Because after all, our system doesn't work on individuals putting themselves up. It's they all, have to be chosen. They have to be chosen by a political group. The organization of an election is such, whether at the state level or at the parliament level. Can I translate that into simple English? When you say there's a disinclination to choose Muslims, what you're saying is political parties do not put up Muslims as candidates. It's a fact. And this is prejudice again. Oh, naturally. How is it that if you are choosing 100 people, you can't find one? The BJP has fought several elections since 2014 in UP, where pretty close to 20% of the population is Muslim, and it's never, either at state or national level, put up a Muslim candidate. In Gujarat, according to Akar Patel, it hasn't put up a Muslim candidate, either at state level or national level, since virtually 1989 or 1990. 
Gujarat has almost a 10% Muslim population. It's not only true of Gujarat, it's true of a lot of states. This is where the prejudice hurts. You see, manifestation of prejudice is a very complex process. And it need not, need not be uh, graphically clear. But it's there. It is there, no question about it. And I take it Muslims feel and sense it. Of course they do, naturally. This hurts them. Personally, I'm a citizen. You see, what I claim is, and this is a valid claim, I am a citizen like you or anybody else in this room is a citizen. Don't differentiate on the basis of my height or my food preferences or my languages or my faith. That's all that Indian secularism should mean. But it's not just that Muslims aren't represented and are in fact prejudiced against in public service or in jobs. Look at the language politicians increasingly use to refer to them. They are referred to by some of the most senior ministers as termites. They're called Babarki or Lad. They're constantly being told, go to Pakistan. And then Dharm Sansads, Dharam Sansads threaten them with genocide and priests publicly on TV say, we'll rape their women. Tell me something, was this sort of thing happening when Nehru and Shastri were Prime no, Minister? No, not even much later. This language is of recent origin. Of the last eight years? I know that you've had a privileged background. I know that you've had an extraordinary life. But I'm still going to ask you this question. Do you have any sense of what it must be like to be an ordinary Muslim in India today? Oh, I meet enough, in terms of numbers, quite a few of them. And some of their grievances are valid grievances. So what is it like to be an ordinary Muslim who's not politically influential, who's not connected to people of influence. What is it like to be an ordinary Muslim? If he has competence, then he has a valid grievance that the competence is not being recognized. If he has no competence, then it's a different matter. Do Muslims feel that they're being ill-treated? Some of them do. We have got living examples of it. We've got instances of it whether of mass mistreatment or individual mistreatment. Has India in the last 10 years increasingly alienated the 15% of its population that is Muslim? I think if you read the language press and the local commentaries, you would come to that conclusion. The language press being Urdu? Not just Urdu. I mean, it may be language press uh, somewhere down south also. But the language press is closer to the people, so it must reflect what they actually feel. To a certain extent. It can be exaggeration also. How worried are you that this is happening? Oh, I am very worried because I think the principle of fraternity is being undermined. And this is also why you said earlier that secularism is critical to India's future. Yes. And when 15% of the country feel alienated, it's a very big number. It's a very big number. It's a, if you add to that other religious minorities, particularly the Christians, then the figure goes up higher, nearer 20. In other words, one out of virtually every five Indians belongs to a religious minority. And today, it may be that only the Muslims and the Christians feel it. But there have been times when other religious minorities have felt likewise, like the Sikhs. In the early 80s, absolutely. And if we go back enough... Uh, in but this is a fault line in India, isn't it? Of course it is a fault line. And you see, this is where the problem comes in with this notion of majoritarianism. That because I am the majority, therefore I have the right to ride roughshod, drive on both sides of the road. And this can endanger the future of India? It can endanger the future of any society. If you don't have rules of the game, then the game cannot be played fairly. So I'm sitting in front of a former vice president 
who I take it is worried about the country's future. Yes, I am worried. As a citizen, I am worried. Do you, in the foreseeable future, see any credible change either for India as a whole or for its Muslim population? Well, I am an optimist, although I am an old man. I am an optimist. But is that optimism simply based on the belief that things will get better or is there some credible reason? No, if you look at our history, even the history of last 75 years, there have been occasions when uh, the correctives have been administered. And you see that happening in the first It can situation? happen. It no, can happen. It can happen. But that's a theoretical possibility. Obviously, I cannot predict the future. Which is why you are a worried man. I should be worried. If I am not sure whether the road is smooth on which I am driving, then I will have to drive very carefully. And that's what, you're, that's what millions of Muslims have to do. Yes. Drive carefully because they don't know what lies on the road ahead. That is not a sense of fear Hindus carry. I think that's a sense of fear which a lot of our fellow citizens have for variety of reasons, not necessarily. But not because of their faith. Not because of their faith. And but Muslims have it because of their faith. Some Muslims would have it because of the faith. Others would share with other uh, rest of the community um, prospects of economic betterment. Mr. Ansari, let's leave it there. You made it crystal clear that you are worried about the direction in which we are heading and you are also worried that the weakening of secularism could endanger the future of our country. It's a critical value in our system. We need to find it back and embrace it again. We have to. We have to. No, no two views about it. This is a reflective of the society we have. We ha did not make the society. The society exists as an existential reality. And secularism is critical to that. Oh, absolutely. Mr. Ansari, a pleasure talking to you. Nice talking to you, Karat. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. <coughs> Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye.